In 2020, I began doing video editing work for a man named Dr. Larry. Dr. Larry had spent 42 years in Texas prison before finally making parole in 2017. He was full of stories from his time in the system and wanted to share them with people. He did several interviews with prison-related YouTube channels and created his own page where he would speak on his experiences and his views on society in general. He built up a small but dedicated fan base and was in talks to turn his life story into a movie. Sadly, he passed away in January 2022 from COVID-19. In the short time he was active, he posted 309 videos. 310, counting the one that was banned from YouTube. He mentioned in a prior video that he had seen uh, things I can't explain in prison. Someone asked him about it in the comments section, and he made a video on an incident that occurred in September of 1979 while he was incarcerated at the Anderson Unit. The video was instantly struck down and his account limited. I think it was on the order of the government. Now, for the first time, the video of Dr. Larry's strange tale can be retold. His story follows. I came to the Anderson unit in 1977 when I was 22. I'd been in East Ham but got transferred out for beating an inmate guard over the head with a pipe. Back then, Texas didn't have guards like they do now. Most of the guards were inmates. Yeah, the building tenders and turnkeys. Uh, building tenders were the guards. I used inmate guards and building tenders interchangeably. And the turnkeys worked in the halls. Uh, they controlled the riot gates, the cell block. If it had a lock, they had a key. We all wore white uniforms, but you could tell a building tender because they had green stripes up the side of their pants and on their shoulders. The building tenders were brutal. If you think regular guards are bad, imagine having a man who killed three people in charge of a cell block. They didn't put up with no bull, and their first resort was violence. If you stepped out of the line, they had an ass whooping for you. Don't expect no fair fight. They'd rather pack you and kill your ass graveyard dead. I saw a lot of guys get the shit beat out of them, and I saw a lot of guys wind up underground. I got lucky at Easton, because the building tender I hit was so sorry that even the others didn't care. They dragged me to solitary, stuck me in, and left me. Next day, I went out on the chain bus to Anderson. Anderson was a plantation before the Civil War. It was turned into a prison in the 1900s. It had 14,000 acres and grew mainly cotton, potatoes, corn, and turnip. Any kind of crop you could think of, they had it. The warden there was named J.T. Turner, but everyone called him Wildcat. With him, you didn't have to do that yes sir, no sir shit. You could talk to him like he was a normal guy. He was the only warden in the Texas prison system you could do that with. He interacted with inmates like he was one of them. He'd come on the block, play table games, get himself a cup of homemade wine, work out with inmates. Anderson was wide open. As long as he went to work, you could do anything you wanted, and Cat was right there with you. A cat had a policy that said inmates could defend themselves. You didn't have to let someone mess over you. He'd tell you to defend yourself, and he'd give you the least amount of punishment possible. If someone tried to mess over you, you could handle your business, but you had to be head up about it. You couldn't come back and kill someone three weeks later. If you did it right then and there, you wouldn't get in trouble. He'd give you a week in solitary or stand you in a soda water crate for six hours. He respected a man who stood up for himself. In fact, he expected you to stand up for yourself. He'd say, you were a gangster out there, be a gangster in here. He didn't respect guys who constantly complained. He had no sympathy for inmates, because the way he saw it, you didn't have sympathy for the crime victim. You don't care about the old lady you robbed and put in the hospital, he'd say. Why the hell am I supposed to care about you? Before he became warden, the cat was a psychiatrist, and he could instantly smell bullshit. You could not get one over on this man. Don't even try. Just be honest and tell him the truth. It was lying that pissed him off. If you did something and told him, Yeah, I did it, he'd go easy on you. If you tried some bullshit game, he'd max out your punishment. 
and they had a lot of punishment waiting for you at Anderson. The favorite thing was putting you in a soda water crate. They'd cuff your hands over your head and leave you there. If you weren't in top physical shape and can't stand on your toes, all your weight would be on your shoulders. For every hour on, you got 15 minutes off. Another thing they did was have you stand on the wall. You have to squat down, hold your arms out in front of you. If you fell down or moved, building tenders would whip your ass and throw you in solitary. Solitary in those days was one of the worst punishments you could get at Anderson. First, the building tenders and turnkeys would whip your ass all the way there. You had a beat down, come right out the gate, and if you didn't get stomped down, you were lucky. Next, they threw you in this dark little cell with no light. You didn't get any books, any paper, none of your personal property. They didn't even feed you right. You got a tablespoon of beets, a tablespoon of corn, and a tablespoon of meat. Depending on what you did in there, the building tenders would come in and beat your ass once or twice a day. You did not want to wind up in solitary. Solitary now ain't shit. Solitary then actually meant something. Back then, Anderson was still segregated. There were two black cell blocks, two white cell blocks, and two Hispanic cell blocks. I work squads were segregated too, but that didn't mean anything. In Texas prison, an inmate's an inmate. The field work was hard, but if you were in shape, you got used to it. Every inmate at Anderson had a job. There was no lying up in your cell. No matter who you were or what you had going on, they had a job for you. Some guys worked in the furniture factory. Others worked in the stables. Most of us worked in the fields. Cotton was Anderson's biggest crop, and during cotton season, we worked from can to can'ts, from when you can see to when you can't. I was young and in good shape, so the field work didn't bother me. Other guys couldn't handle it, and they'd try to get out of it by going to sick bay. If you tried saying you had a headache and couldn't work, the inmate guards in the infirmary would beat your ass, give you an aspirin, and tell you to be careful out in that hot sun. Out in the fields, my job was striker. That meant I didn't have an assignment. I went around helping other guys, catching up if they fell behind. You didn't talk out there. You didn't look around. You didn't take any breaks. If you had to piss, you told the field boss that pouring it down, boss, he'd say, go ahead. If you had to walk behind him, you'd say, coming behind you, boss. If he didn't say that and came up behind him, he'd shoot your ass. We worked with machetes, hammers, and all sorts of weapons so you could attack someone easy. The field boss of my squad was an old-ass man named Cooper, but everyone called him Oh Lord. He dipped snuff, smoked cigarettes, and puffed cigars all at the same time. He'd sit up on his horse and talk shit the whole time, not talking to anyone in particular. I can't say most of what he did, because you two might strike me, but this man was on another level. One time he told the field major who we called High Rider, I'm the god of all black men. Only he used a different term than black men. High Rider just looked at him crazier than hell. You were not prepared for Oh Lord. I don't care what you've been on or who you met. Not only was he out of his damn mind, he was violent as hell. He'd shoot you if you talked back to him, and he loved violence. If a fight broke out, he wouldn't stop it. He'd just sit there and watch. When he had enough, he'd send the water boys in with axe handles to clear it up. He wouldn't just dry fuck you over. If you kept your head down and worked, you wouldn't have a problem with him. And our squad was the best. We worked rings around the other squads, and sometimes Old Lord would make a stop and sit down. He'd tell High Rider, We ain't doing no damn war till the other squads catch up. He'd tell us to smoke our cigarettes and drink our water because we earned it. Old Lord was violent as hell, but he had some good in him. One Christmas he came in, took our whole squad to the commissary, and gave each one of us thirty dollars. So that was some good on him. Anyway, I was at Anderson for two years when the madness happened. That's what those of us who survived call it. It was September, 1979. Cotton season was over, 
so the field bosses had us doing busy work until the harvest. One morning, as we were waiting to be taken out for work, a building tender came up to me and said, Hey man, Warden wants to see you. See me? I asked, confused. Why? He shrugged. I don't know. The cat had an open door policy. All he had to do was knock. Never took advantage of it, cause what was he gonna do for me? If I had a problem, I took care of it on my own. And if I couldn't, I just sucked it up. I didn't need anything from Cat. I didn't know what he wanted from me, so I followed the building tender to his office to find out. Inside, Cat was leaning over his desk and talking to a white guy across from him. A big, burly black man in a white uniform with green stripes up the side loomed over the white guy from behind. His shoulders bunched. He was tense and coiled, ready to strike at a moment's notice. Big Bear, which is what we call him, was Cat's right-hand man and practically ran the prison. He had more power than any other building tender in the Texas prison system, and Cat trusted him enough to send him home on the weekends. Bear would leave Anderson on Friday night, wearing free world clothes and driving Cat's personal car, then come back Sunday evening. No one knows where he went or what he did, and no one asked. Bear was the most violent man at Anderson, one of the biggest at 6'6 and 300 pounds. He intimidated almost everyone. Like the others, he'd leave you alone unless he gave him a reason to mess with you. And whatever this white man was here for, it gave Bear all the reason he needed. I had to let him do it, Cat, the white guy said. He was going to kill me. Why didn't you kill him? Cat asked. You can defend yourself here. You know that. I think you wanted to do it. Bear smacked the white guy upside his head. You like it, huh, punk? He asked. The white guy started to turn around, and Bear slapped him again. Look at the warden when he's talking to you. I don't know what you want me to do about it, Cat continued. I don't have any evidence, just your word. And your word doesn't mean anything to me. Next time someone messes with you, stab him. If you can't do that, just might as well get yourself a husband. Cat looked at Bear. Bear grabbed the back of the white guy's shirt, dragged him to his feet, and shoved him out the door. Get your ass out of here. I stepped aside and the white guy hurried out, not daring to look back. The turnkeys stared him down as he passed. They were itching to do something. You could see it in their eyes. I turned back to Cat, and he donned a big, friendly grin. Larry, it's good to see you. Sit down. He gestured to the chair in front of the desk, and I sat. Bear went over to his desk, sat down, and started going through a stack of papers. How you doing, Larry? Cat asked. I'm doing okay, Cat, I said. You? Cat spread his big hands. He was as big as most inmates and could handle himself in a fight. I'd seen it happen. Not many men had the nuts to attack Cat. But every so often, one bucked up. Black, white, it didn't matter. They all wound up committing suicide in solitary. Every last one of them. Can't complain, Cass said. He sat back in his chair as it creaked under his weight. Well, much. You know, my last cowboy went home the other day, so I'm short-staffed. The cowboy worked in the warden's office. Typing up documents, pulling files, and doing general clerical and go for work. I heard something about that, I said. When I talked to Cat, I kept my cards close to my chest. He was unpredictable. He never knew what his angle was. I need a new one, and I was thinking about you. Me? I asked. You're good at typing and such, Cass said. You're in that college program, and always on your typewriter. Anderson had a college course that the state paid for. You got student loan money on your books every month and used it for class. I went every evening after work and then did homework in my cell until lights out. 
I was also always in the law library looking up laws and codes that might help my case, and I stayed on top of my appeals. When I first got to the retrieve unit in 1975, I filed a lawsuit against the prison system, so Cat knew I was on point. There were only two types of inmates that they were scared of back then. Ones they thought were crazy, and ones that filed lawsuits. I had outside support from my mother, and if you had someone on the outside pulling for you, they tended to tread softly. I was young, but I wasn't stupid. I knew Cat wanted to co-op me, so I wouldn't cause him trouble. Cowboys also count as inmate guards, and I was young and in good shape, and they knew I had a hell of a fight game. If I needed to whip someone's ass, I could. I didn't cause trouble, though. I was too busy trying to get out. If someone started something with me, I ended it. That was all. I didn't throw my weight around, and I didn't bother anyone. Last thing I wanted to do was be an inmate guard and have to jump in beating someone's ass. On the other hand, working in the warden's air-conditioned office beats the hell out of working in that hot sun. I don't know, Cat. I said. I glanced at Bear. He wouldn't pay me any mind. I appreciate the offer, but that's a big decision. If I took that position, the other guys on the block might look at me differently. They might call me a sellout or an Uncle Tom the way they called Bear and Uncle Tom behind his back. Hell, I did it myself. Once I got older, I realized that Bear and Cat were genuinely cool with each other. Cat felt some kind of camaraderie with Bear, and Bear felt it in Cat. At the time, though, I thought Bear was a sellout and all the other damn building tenders, too. I couldn't blame them too much. They got hella privileges and lived well. They were still sellouts, though. Not gonna lie, the more I thought about the privileges I'd get working for Cat, the more I warmed up to the idea. Well, Cat said. Take a day or two to think about it, and get back to me. You don't have to take it if you don't want to, but you're my first choice, and I'll hold it for you. Thank you, Cat, I said. We shook hands and left. I went back to my unit, and a few minutes later, the building tenders led us outside. The day was already hot and dusty, and the occasional breeze felt like sandpaper against my skin. Oh Lord walked up to his horse, stepped into the stirrup, and swung his leg over the horse. His face was wrinkled and his lips puckered. Looking at him, you'd think he was a hard 60 or 65. He was actually 81. All right, load up and get to stepping. Breaking into smaller groups, we climbed into the back of the trucks and set off for our day's assignment along a rutted dirt road. I sat between Johnny Armstrong and Lion Willie. The former was the strongest man in the whole prison, and part of the Anderson boxing team. In those days, each prison had its own basketball team, football team, and boxing team, and they'd all travel around to other prisons for matchups. Johnny Armstrong was undefeated, and he had a fearsome reputation. He'd killed three men since coming to prison, and it was well known that he didn't mind killing more. He never started anything and didn't swing around like a badass. He was kind of quiet stood up for smaller inmates who couldn't defend themselves. The former, the lion Willie, was the biggest bullshitter you ever met. He did nothing but make up stories. That morning, lion Willie was claiming he saw a meteor or something crash into the fields. I'm telling you, man, he'd say. I saw it come out of the sky last night. It looked like a missile. I think them Russians got us, man. They're just not telling us so we could still go to work. Johnny Armstrong chuckled. He was rolling a cigarette. The sleeve of his cotton t-shirt rolled up his massive arms. Funny how only you can see this wild shit. How come no one else saw it? I was looking out my window, man, and there it was. We got nuked, and we're all going to grow tentacles if we go into them fields. Everyone laughed. We reached the worksite ten minutes later. A wall of dead brown brush stretched across from the road. We all jumped off the trucks and leaned up. A water boy handed out machetes, and old Lord looked down at him from his horse like a Confederate statue. That's where I saw it, Lion Willie whispered into my ear. It's over there, 
in the bush. Man, shut the fuck up. I snapped. There was no talk in the fields, and if old Lore heard Willie when he was bullshitting, Willie was gonna have a bad day. And me too. When we had our machetes, we wandered into the brush. Johnny Armstrong was the leader, and set the pace for everyone else. He was a hard worker, and could keep a fast pace, but he went slow for everyone else's sake. I hung back near old Lord and helped out when needed. Old Lord sat on his horse and spat chewing tobacco on the ground, and a water boy brought him a cup of ice water. We field hands didn't get ice water. We got it lukewarm. Working out in that sun, ice water would have killed us. Johnny Armstrong chopped him a wide path in the undergrowth and disappeared. Everyone else rolled out the dead wood on either side. One guy... Ben Jackson sat on the ground and rolled up his pants cuff. I walked over to him. You all right? I asked. Twisted my ankle, he said. You best get up and fight through it before Lore sees you sitting down. As if on cue, old Lore called out. Jackson, why are you sitting down? I twisted my ankle, oh Lord, Ben said. Oh Lord kicked the side of his horse and stared it off. I walked away, wanting no part of what was about to happen. You say you twisted your ankle? The old man asked. Yes, sir. I'm really sorry to be sitting down, sir. I just need a minute's rest. Oh Lord seemed to be considering him for a moment. Let me see your ankle. Ben thrust his ankle out. It was swollen and red. Oh, Lord took a drink of water and spat on Ben's ankle. By the power of my father, you is healed. Now go forth and chop that brush before I shoot your ass. Yes, sir, Ben said. Thank you, sir. He jammed his machete into the ground, used it to push himself up, and hobbled off. Knowing Ben would need help, I stuck by him and picked up his slack. About half an hour later, I was cutting down a cluster of tall weeds when I heard excited talk up ahead. I went over to see what it was and found a group of men standing around in a circle. Johnny Armstrong rubbed the back of his neck, and Lion Willie was talking a mile a minute. See, man, I told you. I told you, man. It came out of the sky. What's going on? I asked. The men parted, and I saw what they were looking at but it took me a minute to process what I was seeing. A curved stone disc jutted out of the ground. The grass around it was charred and burned, and a long scar marked the topsoil, lending the impression the disc had slashed across the earth before reaching its current position. There was strange writing engraved around the disc's rim, and when I knelt down, I noticed a crude drawing of an elongated face. Without warning, It began to glow a sickly shade of green, and I scrambled back with a shocked cry. Everyone else backed away, and Lion Willie tripped over his own feet, landing hard on his butt before scuttling back like a crab. I can't explain it, but as soon as that disc began to glow, a strange and powerful energy filled the clearing. If you ever put two magnets together and felt the pressure between them, it was like that. My feelings ached in my jaw, and my eardrums began to vibrate. Just as soon as it started, it was over. The thing continued to glow, but the tension was gone as surely as if it had never been there at all. Why ain't you working? Oh, Laura called out. Get to moving. This brush ain't gonna clear itself. No one spoke. No one could speak. Finding my voice, I yelled over my shoulder. We found something. What is it? I don't know, I said, and fixed the thing with a wary gaze. Oh, Lord moseyed over and jumped off his horse, shotgun in hand. He bullied his way through the crowd, which had grown, and walked up. Y'all better found some gold to be jerking off like this. You're about as bad as them other squaws now. He looked around. Saw the disc and narrowed his eyes. What's that? I don't know, I said, 
and got to my feet. But I don't like it. Switching his shotgun to his left hand, Old Lord knelt stiffly down and examined the disc. He reached gingerly out and touched it, then whipped his hands back with a hiss. God damn, he said. It is some bitch shocked me. An eerie silence settled over the clearing, and an inexplicable chill raced up my spine. What is it, O Lord? One of the men asked. O Lord got to his feet. I don't know, he said. A sly grin spread across his face. But we all gonna be rich. I had a bad feeling. A bad, bad feeling. Oh Lord called Cat in on the walkie-talkie, and Cat came out of his personal car. The other field bosses and some of their workers had gathered around to see what all the fuss was about and the guys in my squad talked among themselves, trying to figure out where the disc was and where it came from. Suddenly, guys who waved Lion Willie off were listening to him, and everyone was starting to share my unease. Cat put his hands on his hips and stared over the thing with a critical look. Oh Lord told him what had happened, and Cat listened intently. Dig it up, he finally said. One of the water boys fetched a couple shovels and brought them back. Me, Johnny, Armstrong, and a big country boy from one of the other squads dug the disc out of the ground, being careful not to damage it. Maybe it was my imagination, but I could feel waves of dark energy rising from it, like heat from a fevered body. Halfway through, the white boy started to go gray. Sweat poured from him in slimy rivulets, and he had to stop and catch his breath. My heart was slamming wildly against my ribs, and Johnny Armstrong's face had settled into an uncharacteristically angry scowl. It took five of us to drag the disc out of his hole and lay it on the ground. It was roughly two feet by two feet, with a red orb in its center. The orb caught and refracted the sunlight. I made the mistake of looking into it, and it stung my eyes. Careful, Cat warned. We sat down, and Cat touched it with his foot. A piece came off and crumbled into a dozen chunks. Shit, he said. I barely touched it. What'd we do with it? Captain Ferris asked. I loaded it in one of the trucks, Cat said after a minute. We'll send a piece of it to the college and find out what it is, I guess. It's Martians, Lion Willie said. I seen them myself, Cat. They came out of the sky. I thought we were getting nuked by the Russians. Does that look like Martians to you, Willie? Cat asked and nodded to the disc. You're right that it came from space, though. Hell, maybe it does have something to do with aliens. He jerked back his chin towards where the trucks that had brought us out to the fields were parked. Load her up, and be careful. This damn thing might be worth millions. Me, Johnny Armstrong, the white boy, and three others picked the disc up and shuffled toward the trucks. It was far heavier than it had any right to be, and our hands tingled. We loaded it into the bed of one of the trucks, and I instantly blotted my palms on the legs of my pants. I don't like that thing, I said, as the truck drove off in a cloud of dust. It felt slimy, Johnny Armstrong said. He shook his head and rubbed the back of his neck. What is it? The hell if I knew. It looked like one of the ancient Mayan statues in a book on early civilizations I once read, but I don't know enough about that kind of thing to say one way or another. The riding on it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And the face, there was something about it. Something monstrous. Otherworldly, even. All right, old Laura called. You lazy son bitches, get moving. For once, I was grateful for the distraction of hard manual labor. With the disc out of sight and out of mind, I turned my thoughts to Cat's offer. I was pretty sure he had ulterior motives for making me cowboy, but so what? 
I'd always begun to figure out that standing on your principles wasn't always the right thing to do. In prison, it's do or die, and the biggest rule is, look out for yourself. What will be best for me? Working out in these fields or working for Cat? I once told myself I'd never give in to the man, but sometimes the man is the better option. Why else do you think so many people cave in and work for him? I'd never be in and make guard, because I don't have it in me to just drive fuck someone over, but I don't have to do all that as a count boy. And if Cat asked me to, I'd just say no. I was still turning the proposition over in my mind when we quit for the day. The field bosses loaded us up in the trucks and sent us back to the building. And as soon as I had been patted down, I went back to my cell. I grabbed my books and hurried to my class, still wearing my dirty clothes. There were three other men in there, and we were silent as the instructor guided us through the day's workload. An inmate guard was positioned outside the door in case something went down, and no one was willing to break the no-talking rule and earn himself an ass-whooping. After class, I showered and went into the day room of the main hall. A bunch of guys sat around and watched football game on TV. Someone had made a spread, a combination of different things from the commissary, a roast beef, a canned chilies, everything had a cup of homemade wine. I didn't have any homework that day, so I planned to hang out for a little while. That wound up not happening, and no sooner had my butt touched the chair than two guys went to fighting. I don't know what it was about, but they punched and stomped each other like mortal enemies. The M.A. guards gathered around to watch and the rest of us tried to ignore him. In prison, if you look at a fight, you must want to be involved in it. The building tenders laughed and joked like it was a game, but the moment one guy speared the other into the wall, putting a big crack in it, things changed. They rushed in, pulled them apart, and started beating their asses. Look what you did, one of the building tenders said, and forced one of the guys to look at his handiwork. After beating the guys to a pulp, the building tenders set them back to their cells like some naughty kids, and I decided to go ahead and turn in myself. At that point, I had a cell by myself so I can go right to sleep without worrying about someone waking me up. I stretched out of my bunk and dropped off in less than two minutes. In my dream, I was standing in the clearing where we had found the disc, only it was different. The brush was black and charred like old bones, and the sky was the color of red. A hollow, eerie wind swept sheets of reddish topsoil over me in waves, and the back of my neck tingled as if in expectation of a blow. I turned around, but there was nothing. No one. I was totally alone. I don't know how I knew this, but I was the only person for a thousand miles, maybe more, Suddenly, the brush began to shake and stir with unseen life. Blood pounded in my temples and sharp fear squeezed my chest. Beneath the wind, I could make out a faint but persistent shattering, and I was crazily convinced that if I listened carefully enough, I'd be able to make out words. I tried to wrench myself free of the dark spell that had descended over me, but my feet were rooted in place. It was then that I saw the eyes. They watched me from the brush. First, one set. Then two. Then ten. All green and black with elongated pupils like those of a snake. The strongest sense of dread I had ever known came over me. It was like pins and needles. And when the eyes started to come for me, I screamed. I jerked up in bed covered in cold sweat and sucking great gulps of air. The cell block was dark and silent, and for a minute, danger was all around me. I pressed my hand to my favorite forehead and took a series of deep, calming breaths. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I got up and paced around, finally ended up at the window. Beyond the towers and razor wire, beyond the flat, endless expanse of fields, the sun was just beginning to peek over the horizon. The sky around it a stirring shade of pink. Not long thereafter, 
The lights went on, and a building tender came around to wake everyone up. I dressed in fresh uniform and put my boots on. I left my cell, which the building tender had unlocked, and went into the day room. What I saw froze my body. On a table beneath a window, placed like a trophy in a position of honor, was a chunk of glowing stone. It emanated a sickly green light that pulsed and throbbed like a beaten heart, and the air around it seemed to crackle with energy. A few convicts stood around it, scratching the backs of their heads and taking in low, subdued voices. John Armstrong sat in a chair across the room, staring at it with that same angry expression I'd seen in the fields. Tony Jackson, hell of a card player in for robbery, sat beside him and talked about the game and knock he'd won the night before, but Johnny made no sign that he heard or that he was even aware of his friend's presence. What's that thing doing here? I asked. My voice trembled slightly, and I swallowed hard, as if by doing so I could take back my evident unease. One of the building's tenders told me that the stone fell apart when they tried to unload it from the truck. A cat, thinking they found something monumental, ordered that every cell block get a piece. How generous of them. I know it sounds crazy, but I had the strangest feeling that the stone was watching me, like it knew I was there. Never seen anything like that, Mr. Forbes said. An older man with clusters of gray hair at the temples, Mr. Forbes had been at Anderson since 1956. He was a college professor before killing his wife and was the wisest man I knew. He could speak three languages, solve complicated mathematic problems without using paper, and knew everything there was to know about prison life. A lot of guys called him Pops, because he's like a father to us younger inmates, but I called him Mr. Forbes out of respect. What do you think it is? I asked. I'm not sure, he said. I suppose it could have been imbued with a natural phosphorescent chemical, but I've never heard of that. I'm telling you, man. Lion Willie said. It came from space. Mr. Forbes pursed his lips thoughtfully and considered. Maybe, he said. Just maybe. Before I went on for the day, I asked the building tender if I could see Cat. I made up my mind during the morning and wanted to give him an answer as soon as possible. A turnkey brought me to the Cat's office and I went in. Cat was sitting at his desk with an open beer. Bear sitting in a chair beside him, a beer thrust between his fat thighs. They were laughing when I entered. I'm gonna miss the hell out of you when you leave next year, Bear, Cat said. Might just have to frame you for murder so you can stay. Bear chuckled nervously. What do you say, Larry? Cat asked. Want a beer? No, sir, I, I don't drink, I said. Thank you for the offer, though. All right, then, Cass said. Did you think about what I asked you? I opened my mouth to speak, but my eyes fell at a chunk of glowing rock perched on the edge of Cat's desk. A stack of papers was in the way, and I hadn't seen it before. All at once, I could feel the energy in the air, like waves of heat. Cat followed my line aside and grinned. Pretty nifty, huh? I wanted it in one piece, but it came apart. He picked it up and I winced. I almost wanted to tell him not to touch it. He tossed it up in the air and caught it like a baseball. I bet it's valuable as hell. He sat it down again, and I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding. Anyway, you made up your mind? I have, I said. I want the job. Cat broke out into a grin. Good. You hear that, Bear? One day, he's going to take over your position. Not likely. Better him than me, Bear said, 
and he and Kat laughed. Kat told me I could start the next day, and I thanked him, out on the truck to the fields. I gazed off into the distance and wondered if I had made the right choice. I didn't say anything about it, figuring everyone would know soon enough. Across from me, Johnny Armstrong went on with that thousand-yard stare, and Lion Willie talked a mile a minute with a guy named Andrew Johnson. The only time Johnny showed any signs of life was when he turned to Lion Willie and fixed him with an evil stare. He spoke. His flat, dead tone chilled me. I'm getting real sick of your voice. Uh, Hey, man, I was just... Shut up, or I'm going to throw you off this truck. Everyone looked at Johnny crazy. He wasn't a very smart man, but he was kind. The last thing Johnny Armstrong would do was bully someone. He was the kind of gentle giant who knew his strength and used it sparingly. The only time he ever heard him talk about throwing people off of trucks, it was over a serious problem, not a minor annoyance. Fact is, I don't think he ever got annoyed before, at least not over something so trivial. Lion Willie realized he was playing with fire, held up his hands and shut his mouth. We reached the clearing and jumped out of the truck. The water boys passed out our tools for the day. Pickaxes, shovels, and hoes. And old Lord chewed a wad of tobacco up on his horse. We're digging to China today, boys, he said. Tools in hand, we spread out. I hung back and helped guys where they needed it, and then carried armloads of brush back to the road where I dropped them into a pile. Once it was big enough, one of the water boys doused it in gasoline and set it alight. With a soft whump, the heap caught, the crackle of flames hungry and sharp. We'd been out for maybe an hour when I heard a commotion from up ahead. Oh Lord kicked the sides of his horse and moseyed on over to see what had happened, and I followed. A group of men stood around in a circle. I had a flashback to the previous day, But this was worse. Lion Willie lay stretched out on the ground. The side of his head caved open and leaking blood like a busted watermelon. Johnny Armstrong was on top of him. His big hands wrapped around Lion Willie's throat. He gritted his teeth and stared out of a sweat-sheened face with bulging eyes. A fat vein pulsed on the side of his neck and his arm muscles strained. Say, man, the dude's dead, one of the guys said. Johnny Armstrong jerked his head up, and I fell back. His pupils, they looked like the eyes from my dream, diamond-shaped, the cold, hateful gaze of a snake. He unhanded Lion Willie's neck and got to his feet, panting and hissing through his teeth. God damn, old Lord said when he saw a lion Willie. What'd he ever do to you? Johnny spun around and fixed old Lord with a mud gaze. Old Lord recognized it at once and raised his shotgun. I expected a warning, an insult, something. But before I knew what was happening... Old Lord was pulling the trigger. Fire leapt from the barrel, and Johnny flew back, landing on the ground with a heavy thud. Bright red blood stained his lips and the front of his t-shirt. His eyes were open, and when I looked into them, they were back to normal, if they had ever been wrong at all. No one spoke. No one moved. We were used to death and violence, but something about this got to us. Lion Willie was harmless and well-liked on the block. Johnny Armstrong was the kind of man who'd give you the shirt off his back. None of it made sense, and seeing both of them lying there, dead, one killed by the other, hurt. It hurt us deeply, and I, for one, felt like I was going to puke. Instead, 
I helped a few of the other guys carry Willie and Johnny's lifeless body to one of the trucks. The other field bosses had come over to see what had happened. The old lord told him straight up. As much as I didn't like that man, I could hardly blame him for what he did. He should have called out a warning instead of shooting first, but the look in Johnny Armstrong's eyes told me that he wouldn't have heeded it anyway. Maybe it was the heat. Maybe he'd got bad news from home. But the man had gone insane. Maybe something else was responsible. Maybe it was that damn stone. I pushed that thought out of my mind as soon as it came in. That was ridiculous. No piece of rock, no matter how strange or eerie, can drive a man into a murderous frenzy. It had to be something else. What? I don't know. And to be honest, I didn't want to find out. At lunch, they brought us back to the prison. One thing about Anderson, the food was good. It's up to the warden how good you eat. They might blame the state or the governor if the child's lousy, but they're lying to you. The food at Anderson was restaurant quality. It was so good that Cat would sometimes bring his family into the inmate chow hall and eat with the rest of us. In my 42 years in the Texas prison system, Anderson was the best. It was brutal, and you had to work harder than hell, but you got good food and almost unlimited privileges. As long as you went to work... You could make it there. Anyway, the cafeteria was buzzing with the news of what had happened in the field. When I sat across from Mr. Forbes, he leaned over the table. Is it true what they're saying? He asked. Mr. Forbes didn't work in the field. He ran the prison library. What are they saying? I asked. On the ride back, no one said a word. They said Johnny Armstrong killed Willie, Mr. Forbes said, and that old lord shot Johnny for it. I stabbed my fork into my corn and crinkled my nose. Earlier, I was hungry, but after what happened, the smell of baked chicken turned my stomach. Yeah, that's what happened, I said. Mr. Forbes sat heavily back, an expression of bafflement stamped on his face. Why? he asked. Why did Johnny do it? What could Willie have done to him to provoke that? I don't know, I said. I was in the back row and didn't see anything. He was acting funny, though. Willie? I shook my head. No, Johnny. How so? For a moment, I collected my thoughts. He just wouldn't himself. He was pissed off the moment I saw this morning. Mr. Forbes shook his head. He and Willie were friends. I just... I don't understand it. A shadow fell over us, and we both looked up. Cat stood there with his lips tightly pursed. He looked like he had to take a shit, but couldn't quite get it out. Mr. Forbes, how you doing? He asked. Mr. Forbes was so well respected that even Cat called him Mr. Not too good, Cat, Mr. Forbes said. They're saying Johnny killed Willie. Cat nodded grimly. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Do you know why? That's not like Johnny Armstrong. He made mistakes, like all of us, but he wasn't a bad man. I know. Cat said. The best I can figure, Johnny lost it and brained the first person he saw. Probably would have killed someone else if he wasn't shot. He looked at me. When you're finished... Come to my office. I'll go ahead and start you today. Since my appetite was gone, I started to get up. No hurry, Cat said. Take your time. 
I'm done anyway, I said. Something wrong with the chicken? Cat asked. Nah, I just lost my appetite. I offered my tray to Mr. Forbes, but he shook his head no. Some dude I didn't know leaned over the table and snatched my chicken up like he was starving. At Anderson, you could eat as much as you wanted, so you never went hungry. He'd work like hell, but you wouldn't go hungry. I would have busted his ass any other time, but this wasn't any other time. So I put my tray in the window and followed Cat back to his office. My first job as count boy was to type up an incident report on what had happened. High Rider, the highest ranking field boss, took statement from a couple of men who'd seen Johnny attack Willie, and I had to put it all together. I sat before the typewriter and pecked at the keys. The constant click-clack drowned out my thoughts. My second job was to plan Willie and Johnny's funerals. I went out to the prison cemetery with a building tender and a clipboard. All the plots used and otherwise were marked off, and all the empty ones were denoted by a check mark. Rows of simple stone crosses stamped with names and dates clustered among the mangrove trees like ghosts huddled in mourning, and something about the sight disturbed me. I picked out where Johnny and Willie would be buried, then walked over to the furniture factory to order two coffins. They were expecting me, but they wouldn't start work until they had an order slip signed by Cat, which I gave them. I was buddies with the foreman of the factory, and it made him for embezzlement, and we kicked it for a little while. It was my first day, so I don't want to make a bad impression, I told him in parting. The rest of the afternoon kept me busy with little tasks. At six, right before Cat left, he sent me down to the infirmary with the medical files of an inmate who was in sick bay. When I got there, he was lying on a cot with his hands pressed to his stomach. His face was slick and gray, and his eyes were pools of misery. I recognized him at once. The white guy who helped us load the stone in the back of the truck. An inmate guard took the file, opened it, and lazily paged through it, his face a perfect mask of apathy. He didn't care if this man lived or died, or even if he were here at all. Say, man, what's wrong with him? I asked. Probably gas, the guard said. People always come in here with stupid shit. He looked over his shoulder when the white guy groaned. Fart it out or we're going to beat it out. As I walked back to Cass' office, a chill settled over me. I couldn't say why at the time, but the bad feeling I had earlier was back with a vengeance. Inmates were always getting sick or hurt, but something about this felt off. Later, I had put two and two together. Johnny and that white guy both loaded that stone onto the truck now one was dead after going fully psychopath, and the other was laid up in a sick bay puking his guts out. Coincidence. It had to be, but there was still this little nagging in the back of my head. Sitting at the typewriter once more, I glanced at the glowing rock on Cat's desk. When I was out and about, I felt fine, but now... After sitting for 15 or 20 minutes, my feelings were starting to ache, and the beginnings of a headache pinched my temples. The room steadily got stuffier and stuffier till it was hard to breathe. Cat poured over paperwork like nothing, and Bear came and went, never once saying anything. I'm a rational and educated man now as I was then. I knew that it had to be me but I couldn't help looking at that damn stone. You think maybe this thing's dangerous? I asked. I didn't realize I was going to speak until the words were out. Cat looked at me. Dangerous? I scoffed under his scrutiny. The way it glows reminds me of radiation. 
He grinned. Oh, no, we checked it for that. It's 100% safe. He laid his hand on it, and his smile seemed to sharpen at the corners. I could have sworn I saw a green glimmer in his eyes, but that was crazy talk. I went back to work and tried to put it out of my mind. Little did I know, this was only the beginning. Friday, September 28th, 1979, was the day Old Lord fell off his horse, dead. It was about 10 a.m. and I'd been going back and forth between Cat's office and the infirmary where a half a dozen inmates of assorted races were laid up complaining of cramps, puking, and nightmares. It had been a week since I started working for Cat, and in that time, things at Anderson had gotten strange. On Saturday, an inmate attacked an inmate guard with a metal dustpan and split his head open. He was panting and wide-eyed. White foam spilling from his mouth. A group of building tenders stomped him into the ground and dragged him to solitary, where he ripped on his own wrist with his teeth and bled out. On Sunday, a man on my cell block put a can of beans in a sock and beat his cellmate with it. The building tenders dragged him off, and the whole way to solitary, he kicked and screamed. A lot of guys were feeling queasy and having bad dreams. I was one of them. Every night I dreamed of the clearing. Only now, instead of just eyes, Johnny Armstrong and Lyle and Willie's eyes were there. They stood side by side and watched me, their faces slack and blue in death. They'd always throw back their heads and open their mouths as one. And every time they did... Blinding green light shot out, whereupon I'd wake up in a cold sweat. Cat was worried because people kept going loony and was also concerned by the epidemic sweeping the prison. The white guy who helped us load the disc onto the truck, the first one to show symptoms, had been sent to a free world hospital. The last I reported, he was rapidly improving. Whatever it was, it wasn't that serious. But Cat was scared of getting sick himself. He made me and Bear wear a medical mask when we walked around him and barely left his office. A few times I knocked and he didn't answer. I went in and found him staring blankly at the stone, his hand resting on its surface like he was communicating with it. As for Bear, he was losing weight. I don't know exactly how much the man weighed, but he wasn't small, and every day his uniform seemed a little looser on him. I mentioned in passing that he looked good, and he favored me with an incredulous expression. I'm not doing anything different, he said. With the sickness spreading through the prison, fear and paranoia was beginning to set in. A lot of guys on my block didn't sit in the day room anymore, but stayed in their cells. You didn't see people kicking in much anymore, and everyone gave each other wide passage in the halls. That day, I just sat down to type when the walkie-talkie on Cat's desk crackled. It's so Lord. High Rider came back. He's dead. That seemed to snap Cat out of it. Dead? He asked. I was riding by and saw him on the ground. I checked his pulse, and he's dead all right. I'll be right there, Cat said. He got up and motioned to me. Come on, Larry. Let's see who finally got him. No one, as it turned out. Per the man in his squad, he'd been acting funny all morning, more subdued than usual constantly looking down at his palms and wiping buckets of sweat from his face with a handkerchief. Finally, at just before 9.50, he started to sway back and forth on his horse, then toppled face first into the dirt. The men were too scared to approach him, so they just left him where he was. They said they thought it was a trick and that he'd shoot the first one to touch him or that he'd come awake in a panic and start firing thinking his helpers were actually trying to hurt him. Best to just keep working. 
When Cat and I showed up in Cat's personal car, O'Lor was lying in the dirt with one leg bent and his shotgun lying next to him. No one touched it. Probably hadn't even thought of touching it. One of his gnarled hands was open, but the other was clenched in a tight fist. Cat knelt down beside the dead man and pried his fingers open. In his palms, he held a small, glowing piece of stone. A murmur went through the crowd of convicts who had gathered around, and Cat wiped sweat from his face. It looks like a heart attack to me, he said. He plucked the stone from Old Lord's hand and shoved it greedily into his pocket. Someone help Larry put him in the truck. Me and a guy named Quincy loaded Old Lord in the back of one of the trucks like a pile of brush. After that, his squad was combined with high riders, and they went back to work like nothing had happened. He was too damn old, Cass said in the car. I should have retired him. You know he had a weak heart, right? That's all it was. Nobody's fault. He sounded like he was trying to convince me of a lie. It took a few days for the coroner to issue his official report, and until then, all the guys in the squad were in lockdown, just in case. I knew the moment I saw that damn stone that it wasn't a man who killed old Lord, or even a heart attack. It did something to him, and that's why he was acting funny. And he wasn't the only one. Mr. Forbes wouldn't go near the day room, and a few of the other guys looked nervous when they passed it. That stone still sat in his place of honor, and whenever anyone got close, it started to flash, like it was excited to see us. Mr. Forbes and a few others were always tired and slept most of the day in their cells. Maybe paranoia was getting to me, but every time I walked on the block, a strange feeling washed over me. You ever gone into a place and instantly felt pressure, like the air itself was hostile and trying to strangle you? That's how the cell block felt, and too much of it made me claustrophobic. I did everything I could to avoid going there during the day, and as Cat's cowboy, I had almost free run of the prison. I could go pretty much anywhere and do just about anything, so I only went back to my cell to sleep. Saying it out loud like this sounds crazy even now, but some way, somehow, that disc we dug out of the ground was responsible. I knew it. I knew it like I knew my own name, even though I couldn't explain or even rationalize it. I don't think it was radiation but I figured it worked on the same principle. I didn't know much about radiation, but I did know that it attacked you if you got too close to it, like a virus. Whatever that disc was, it was emitting some kind of energy that was affecting everyone around it, and not all in the same way. I tried bringing up the subject with Cat, but he laughed me off. A few days after Old Lord died, a man in the Hispanic cell block went apeshit in his cell. He ripped his shirt off and jumped around like a monkey, banging on the bars and screaming that he couldn't breathe. The building tenders told him to shut up and threatened him with a beatdown, but he only got worse. Finally, he started slamming his head against the wall and begging to be let out. The building tenders went in to get him, and he managed to slip away. He ran down the cell block, lowered his head like a charging bull, and rammed the hard, cinder-block wall, skull first. On the other side of the prison, an old guy, who'd been working in the furniture factory for thirty years, calmly doused himself with paint thinner and struck a match. Flames engulfed him in seconds, and he just stood there as he burned. Finally, he fell to his knees, and then to his face. I knew things were getting bad when the free world guards, of which there were only a handful, started calling in sick and outright quitting. High Rider, who had been at Anderson for going on twenty years, came into Cat's office one day while I was typing a transfer slip for an inmate who'd gone insane and was being sent to the state hospital. 
Cat was staring fixedly onto the glowing depths of his beloved stone, a sickly grin on his face. Like Bear, he looked like he'd lost weight, and his sandy blonde hair was beginning to go thin and gray. I told myself it had been doing that for a long time, but it hadn't. There's something going on out there, High Rider said. People keep getting sick, going crazy, burning themselves up. It's a madhouse, Cat. I just had a water boy jump in the river and try to drown himself. I want to know what's happening. Cat turned his head slowly, his fevered expression never changing, his grin never faltering. High Rider blinked in surprise and grasped a moment for a reply. Cat looked crazy. Nothing, Cat said at last. Nothing's wrong. These things happen. He lay his hand on the stone and stroked it like an evil villain petting his favorite lap cat. We're a prison, after all. You have to expect a certain amount of death and insanity. Me and High Rider both looked at Cat like he had lost his mind. By now it was obvious that all wasn't well at Anderson. Even Ray Charles could see that. Everyone could, except for Cat. If you're not man enough to work here... Cat went on. Just say so. Give me your badge, and I'll put someone in your place. If you don't want that to happen, you can just shut your mouth and get. High Rider's eyes flashed with indignation. He quickly unbuckled his gun belt and dropped it on Cat's desk with a thunk. He plucked the badge from over his heart and dropped that, too. I quit. To my surprise, Cat just laughed. A long, loud roar that sent High Rider storming out. Cat threw back his head, gripped the edge of the desk, and shrieked until tears rolled down his cheeks. And they always looked that sunken. Or was it only the lighting? He turned to me, and I flashed a wan smile. I sure told him, Cat said. You sure did, I said. As soon as I was done with the transfer slip, I got out of there and walked around the halls, thinking. The infirmary was packed with sick men, and there weren't as many turnkeys in the corridor as usual. They were either sick or in hiding, or maybe they just walked off like High Rider. Escape from Anderson was virtually impossible, but there was something in the air. It felt like order had broken down and anything could happen. Order hadn't broken down, of course. That would come later. And it would come hard. For now, though, things were just flaky. As they typically are right before civilizations collapse. Reluctantly, I made my way back to the cell block. Two turnkeys flanked the door their white hats low on their heads and rifles in their hands. I missed a beat. No one carried a gun inside the prison, except for the field bosses, and even then they were only passing through and not engaging with inmates. Say, man, what's with the gun? I asked. Cat's orders, one of the turnkeys said. Orders? I knew nothing about those orders. A man knocked at the door from the inside, and one of the turnkeys opened it. What? I got a problem with a guy on our line. I'm gonna go call on him. The turnkey glared at him. You wanna get it? All right. Before they let him pass, they patted him down. From the way they worked, they were looking for something specific. Not a shank or drugs, but... Something. They didn't pat me down, so that told me they were worried about something leaving, and not something coming in. I found Mr. Forbes sitting in his cell. He looked up at me when I came in, and my stomach sank. His expression was blank, void. His eyes saddened and glazed. 
He shook his head, and suddenly, he was his old self again, his eyes crisp and sharp, his features warm and brotherly. I gotta talk to you, I said. About what, youngster? I sat beside him on the bunk and rested my face in my hands. He turns to me. A look of fatherlike concern crossed his face. What's wrong, Larry? He asked. So I told him. I told him about Cat and Bear, about High Rider and the Hispanic who headbutted the wall. I even told him what I thought was causing all this. It's that thing we found. It's putting off negative energy or something. I tried to tell Cat, but it's getting to his mind. Mr. Forbes listened, and when I was done, he sighed. I'll talk to him. I don't know if that'll even help. I've known Cat for years, Mr. Forbes assured me. We have a mutual respect. If he'll listen to anyone... It'll be me. I was grateful for his help, and realized only then how alone I had felt keeping all this to myself. Sometimes you can get too good at holding your cards too close to your chest. Since I was late, and Cat had probably already left, Mr. Forbes decided to talk to him in the morning. About six, I woke up and took a shower. The cell block was eerily quiet, and I didn't see a single inmate guard. I knew they were around somewhere, but where? The day room. Four of them stood around the chip of stone in a semicircle, staring into its pulsing core with the same glazed eyes I'd seen on Mr. Forbes the day before. I called to them, but they didn't reply. They didn't turn. Made no sign that they had heard me at all. The green glow bathed their faces in a sickly pallor, and when I waved my hand in front of one's eyes, nothing happened. He didn't even blink. It was at that point that I first felt scared. Later on, when I came out of the shower, the guards were gone and everything seemed normal. I dressed in my cell and was just lacing up my boots when one of the building tenders poked his head in. Cat needs you, he said, right now. I nodded, finished with my boots, and hurried down the hall. Ahead, the door to Cat's office opened, and two building tenders carried something out between them. When I saw what it was, my bowels turned to ice water. Mr. Forbes. His head was slumped to one side, and the front of his white uniform was splattered with bright red blood. One hand dragged along the ground as the building tenders hustled by me, and I gaped in a mixture of shock and horror. I turned just as Cat came out of his office. Overnight, his skin had begun to crack and wrinkle, and the color had drained almost entirely from his sparse hair. Dark spots swirled across his neck and forearm, and his eyes were a faded hue that suggested many years in the sun. He saw me, and his brow angled down in an angry V. Clean that blood off of my floor and walls. With that, he brushed past me. That, I later decided, was the tipping point. Anderson had jumped from the frying pan and landed smack dab in the middle of the fire. Over the next two days, darkness settled over the Anderson unit. Sickness and insanity spread through the cell blocks and the infirmary became overwhelmed. Cat ordered that no man was to be sent to an outside hospital, no exceptions, and every time someone went stark raving mad, Cat had him locked in solitary. Those men never lasted long. They'd always beat their heads against the wall till they died or sweat themselves to death. Some probably did make it, 
but I suspect a lot were killed by building tenders on Cat's orders. The ranks of the cemetery swelled like a fat pig, and sometimes they'd bury five or six men in a single day. By the weekend, all the free world guards had quit, except for one, who jumped from one of the guard towers, and then went down on his revolver when the fall didn't kill him. There was precious little oversight of prisons by the Texas Department of Corrections in those days, but Huntsville, the beaten heart of TDC, received the count every night and was beginning to make noise about so many inmates dying. On Tuesday morning, they sent us a teletype to say they were sending an inspector out to see what was going on. Cat coughed wetly into his fist as I read it to him and Bear dozed at his desk. He had dropped so much weight that he was beginning to look pale and sickly. When he wasn't sleeping, he was scurrying off to be gone for hours on end, nowhere to be found. They wouldn't like him. He took his passion as honorary deputy warden very seriously. But no one was very much like themselves anymore. Even me. Nightmares plagued my sleep and fear gnawed at me during the day. I'd planned to call the college cat had sent the rest of the stone to, but he had the switchboard operator kill half the phones and route every outgoing call through his office. He was the only one with access to the open world. Not much access, though. He had taken to sleeping in his office and oftentimes wouldn't dress until well after noon. Paperwork piled up on his desk, and he skipped important meetings. All he did was stare at that damn rock, and waste away as he did so. Because all the free world guards had left, Cat didn't have anyone to man the towers. He put a couple building tenders in each, and gave him rifles, telling him, Shoot anything that moves. No one comes in or out. They were only too happy to oblige. As things spiraled out of control, the fields were left untended. To that point, Cat's main concern, his only concern, was the crop. Anderson lived and died by its crops, and watching Cat let it all go to seed so he could keep court with that chunk of space junk was as surreal as seeing Jesus Christ strangling a hooker. It got to where he hunched over the rock like a dog protecting its dinner, and any time you got near him, He'd give you a mean look. At one time I came into the office and he was talking to it. Not a one-sided conversation like you'd have with an animal. He was talking to that thing like the way he'd talk to me or Bear. When he finished, he'd cocked his ear and listen. When he did that, the stone pulsed faster. Like it was talking back. On Wednesday, a group of convicts beat down a couple of building tenders and chased them off their unit. From what I heard, they ran wild, destroyed everything they could touch. They flooded toilets, broke sinks off the walls, and started fires. A team of building tenders went in with steel pipes, axe handles, and brass knuckles, and the gangs proceeded to beat the hell out of each other. When it was all said and done, five men were dead, and ten more were seriously wounded. That night, Cat told me to fudge the count to Huntsville. Just count the dead ones, Cat said into his stone. That's a good idea. I count the dead ones. He giggled like a little girl. By this point, his hair was beginning to fall out, and his lips were split. The skin on his face, neck, and forearm had turned a light pink color and I could count a dozen open sores across his withering body. I did as he told me to, then I went back to my cell to think. I had no doubts anymore. The piece of stone we found in the fields was causing all this somehow, and I was alone in a sea of madness. Cat was insane. Most of the building tenders were insane, or going insane, and the inmates were insane. Aside from the nightmares, I was no worse for the wear, and I deduced that there had to be others like me. They were probably hiding in their cells or plotting to escape in the confusion. 
if they hadn't done so already. Should I try and round them up? If so, what will we do? No, I decided. And my best course of action was waiting for the inspector from Huntsville to show up. I'll get him alone and tell him what's going on. Then they could bring in doctors, scientists, or whoever handles aliens from outer space. I didn't have to wait long. Cat told me the next morning that the inspector was due around noon. Are you going to let him in? I asked. The warden favored me with a nasty grin. His once perfect teeth were yellow and crooked. They looked longer, as if they were starting to slide out of his gray gums. I'm going to let him in, all right, he said. I didn't like the gleam in his eye. If I knew anything about Cat, it was that that meant danger. And it did. There were two towers flanking the front gate of Anderson. A group of building tenders had set up shop in one of them and, per Cat's orders, hadn't come down in days. A turnkey brought them their meals and, every so often, they'd shout deranged threats at anybody walking from one building to another. I heard a rumor that one of them sniped a building tender and that they cheered and danced around like lunatics. I don't know if it was true or not, but I had a sinking feeling like it was. Like I've said, the building tenders were tight. They were the closest thing Texas prison had to a gang back then, and they stuck by each other. All for one, one for all. If these guys were picking off their own kind, you knew they were crazy. Every time I had to leave the building to go somewhere, to the furniture factory or the graveyard... I ducked and scurried. They never fired at me, but they did hurl abuse at me. That Friday, whether on word from Cat or not, they were waiting for the inspector to show up. Just before noon, a silvery, blue Chevy station wagon appeared in the distance, its glinting body wrapped in dust. The head building tender, Pokey Adams, alerted the others to its presence and jutted his chin towards the approaching vehicle. Wait till they get close, then we'll take them. The car drew closer and closer. Finally, Pokey jammed the butt of his rifle into the crook where his arm met his shoulder, lined up his shot, and jerked the trigger. The front passenger tire exploded, and the car fishtailed. The driver overcorrected, and the station wagon ran off the road into a ditch. Ten points, Lester Holmes cried. Insane laughter swept the tower. Order in the gates opened. Pokey led his men down the road. The riverside door swung open, and a man in a tweed jacket got out. He held up his hands. We're from Huntsville. He said quickly, We. Pokey raised the rifle and fired. The shot tore out the man's throat in a spurt of blood and spun him around. He fell to the ground and the building tenders laughed. The passenger door popped open and a woman in a skirt and blouse spilled out. She darted away and ran as fast as her heels would allow her, which wasn't very fast at all and the building tenders gave chase. They caught up to her, and Pokey flung her to the ground. You'd expect a group of men who'd been in prison, away from women, to have one thing on their mind. They didn't. They beat the ever-loving shit out of her, instead of doing anything else. They kicked and stomped her, battered the back of her head with their fists, and slammed the butt of their rifles into her face. Her nose burst, her eye sockets shattered, and her jaw broke in three different places. By the time they were done, she was a bloody pulp. They brought her into the infirmary, like that was going to do anything for her, and fifteen minutes later, she died. If shit wasn't real before, 
It sure got real then. I went to the infirmary on business from Cat, and when I saw that woman lying there, her skull crushed and blood oozing from her ruined cranium, I knew I had to do something. For the rest of the day, I sat at the typewriter and turned the problem over in my head. Cat stroked and serenaded that damn rock, and an idea came to me. Could I do it on my own? I didn't know. I might need another set of hands. Who could I trust? Only one name came to mind. After Cat left for the day, taking that horrible stone with him, I went through a stack of papers and found a number. I called it on Cat's phone and it rang. On the third ring, a voice answered, sounding annoyed. Hello? Hi, Ryder, I asked. Silence filled the line. Who's this? Hi, Ryder asked, suspiciously. It's Larry, I said, from the prison. I hesitated. I need your help. The day I called Hi, Ryder, all order finally broke down at Anderson. The inmate guards remaining in the prison banded together and rode in on a cell block with hammers, machetes, and steel pipes. They beat and hacked up ten men and drove the rest out into the halls, where they wandered aimlessly around, beating their heads against the wall and muttering incoherent nonsense. The building tenders painted themselves with the blood of their fallen enemies, cut chunks of flesh from their bodies, and had themselves won a hell of a meal. A few other guys started a fire, and the building tenders came to put it out wearing only loincloth and bloody paint. They hooped and hollered like Indians and beat the shit out of the arsonists. Another guy, one of the few who hadn't gone insane, hanged himself with a bedsheet to escape the madness, and his friends cut off his head and played volleyball with her. Scenes like this unfolded all over the prison as darkness fell. Violence and murder swept from one end to the other, and the few inmates in their right mind hid themselves best they could. My unit was largely quiet. The building tenders had gone, and a dozen or so convicts left were all sick, dead, or laying low. The guy in the cell next to mine lay in his rack, coughing and shivering. Down the hall, someone screamed for mother and on the other side of the hall a guy stood at his cell door and furiously masturbated with a piece of steel wool. I stayed in my cell with the light off and listened to the muffled screams coming from the other cell blocks. The sun gradually sank behind the cotton fields and its amber light drained from the cell. In the cool afterglow I checked my watch. Soon I would put my plan into action. Not gonna lie, I was nervous as hell. Going into prison, I was already in top physical shape and had a hell of a fight game. I wasn't afraid of anyone, and I handled my business when I had to. This was different, though. I wasn't going up against one guy, or even three. I was going against insanity personified. Might as well be up against the entire population of Anderson, and even with the sick, dead, and hopelessly insane... That was a tall order. At 8 p.m., I switched my lamp on, got up, and went to my cell door. In those days, you could come and go as you wanted, and at the end of the day, you closed and locked your own cell. Usually, once you did that, you were in until an inmate guard came around to let you out. Before leaving Cat's office that afternoon, I took a ring of keys so that I could lock my cell and then unlock it again. I slipped my hand through the bars, inserted the key into the lock, and turned it. Across the hall, the guy stood in the shadows, grinning and jacking it for all he was worth. I ignored him and went to the big steel door leading off of the pod. I pressed my face to the glass and scanned the corridors. No turnkeys were at their posts. They had been just a few hours ago when I came back from work. 
They patted me down like they were looking for something in particular. I had no way of knowing that. I call it a feeling, but I was sure they were looking for bits of stone. What they would do if they caught you trying to smuggle some out, I couldn't say. But let's just say, it'd be a wrap for you. I unlocked the door and poked my head out. The sounds of battle, cries of pain, and mad cackling drifted from different cell blocks. But aside from a dead man lying on his side like a wounded animal, the hall was empty. Shutting the door behind me, I hurried towards Cat's office. Someone threw themselves against one of the cell block doors as I passed, and I jumped. A dozen naked men, their mouths crusted in blood, banged at the door in an attempt to get me. I stared at him in horror, then went on, my step quickening. Near Cat's office, I found a turnkey sitting up against the wall. His neck was swollen, and his skin had taken an ashy color that made me think he was dead until he opened his muddled eyes. Sweat sheened his face, and when he drew a breath, I could hear phlegm in his throat. My first instinct was to help him, but when I tried, he pulled out a shank and swiped it at me. So I left him there. I'd check on him later. First, I had something to do. In Cat's office, I rummaged around in his desk, found a key for the filing cabinet in the corner, the one I'd never gone into, and opened it. Inside were cans of beer, bottles of liquor and wine, and a box of cigars. I fetched a plastic milk crate from its spot next to Bear's desk, packing it with as much booze as I could carry, and took it outside. The night was hot and still and the music the crickets made drifted over the cotton fields. I walked up to the door into the occupied tower and banged on it like a sheriff with a warden. Above, someone stuck his head over the platform. What do you want? He asked sharply. I got some stuff down here, Cat sent you. I said. I held the box up. What is it? Come find out. The head disappeared, and a minute later, three building tenders appeared at the door, holding rifles. One of them went through the box and pulled out a bottle of Southern Comfort. God damn, y'all. It's payday, he said, and laughed. They took their pay into the tower and slammed the door in my face. You're welcome. Back in the prison... I kicked it in the mayor's office with the lights out. I had a direct line of sight to the tower and in the floodlights. I could just make out the building tenders taking swigs from various bottles. I stood at the blinds and watched them, waiting. Go on, you assholes. Get toasted. They did. One of the men was so drunk that he stumbled out onto the platform, beer in hand, and started to dance. The others laughed, and the dancer got bolder. So bold, in fact, that when he inevitably fell, he went over the railing and plummeted to the ground below. He lay there, bent and twisted, while the others ran to see if he was okay. When they saw that he wasn't, they laughed and went back to drinking. By 11 p.m., all noise and movement in the tower had ceased. They had all passed out, according to plan. At midnight, I crept out the door and stole across the yard to the back gate, which Cat had left unguarded, because no one used it. I waited in the shadows until I heard the crunch of approaching feet. I stayed where I was, in case it was a building tender or another inmate. But High Rider strode out of the night, dressed in blue jeans, cowboy boots, and a plaid shirt. A tall, slim man with icy blue eyes and hard, scrabble features. High Rider reminded me of Clint Eastwood, an association he carefully cultivated and encouraged. He spoke sleepily and never got excited no matter what happened. I'd seen him angry on more than one occasion, and unless you knew him, 
You'd never be able to tell. His neck would get red and his jaw would clench ever so slightly, but otherwise, he looked like he always did. I unlocked the gate and he slipped in. He had a hunting rifle slung across his back and a revolver shoved into the waistband of his jeans. You gonna tell me what's going on? He asked. Bad shit, I said, and looked around. I told him about the inspectors from Huntsville, and he favored me with an incredulous expression. Son, that sounds like some bullshit. Follow me. I led him back to the prison, and we went inside. The hall was deserted, and the silence was so total that you could hear the blood rushing through your veins. Trash and broken junk and dead bodies littered the floor. The high rider whistled through his teeth. The infirmary was a charnel house. Flies buzzed around bloated corpses, and the smell was so powerful it knocked us back. I showed high rider the woman's body and he gaped at it. You say Cat ordered them to do this? Yeah, I said. He rubbed the back of his neck. I can't believe that. A cat wouldn't do something like that. I'd agree with you if I didn't know better, I said. That stone's messing with his mind. I told High Rider about my theory, and he listened. At first, looking unconvinced, then thoughtful, then finally concerned. That's crazy talk, he scoffed. There wasn't much conviction in his voice. How so? I asked. Radiation does pretty much the same thing. If that thing came from space, there's no telling what it's picked up. A gamma rays or some kind of disease from Alpha Centauri. I don't know about you, but... I know what I've seen. You know Cat's not acting right, and you know there are ten dead bodies right here. You can't deny that, and you can't tell me it didn't start when he dug that rock out of the ground. High Rider chewed his bottom lip in thought. His eyes were troubled, and for a moment, he stared down at the woman's battered body. Finally, he said, All right, what do we do? We gotta get rid of those stones. How? I told him the plan. First we had to make sure each cell block was secure and that no one could get out. I had a list of every turnkey and building tender and knew half of them by sight alone. Originally, I was gonna track each one down and seize their key rings if they had one, but that'd be too dangerous. I remember there was a store of fresh padlocks in the workshop of the furniture factory, along with chains. We could lock each door from the outside and shut everyone up tight. Once that was done, we'd go out to Cat's house, which was on the prison grounds, and take that stone away from him. Maybe once it was out of his clutches, he'd start thinking clearly again. I wanted to destroy every piece of that stone we could find but going on to most of the blocks would cause a bloodbath as the men inside tried to protect it. The way I looked at it, each individual piece was powerful, and all of them together, under one roof, was causing all this. I hoped that just getting rid of a few would weaken its hold on Anderson. Now, you might be asking yourself, why didn't I just call Huntsville? For one thing, I was scared of bringing him into it. I knew what happened was bound to get out, but I didn't want to bring in the government or anyone else since there was no telling what they'd do. At the very least, they'd study us like lab rats. At worst, they might decide we were infected and blow us up. I knew there was no way this could stay in-house, but I guess I hoped maybe it could. My hope was that Cat would get better and we could pass this off as some kind of riot. It was a hell of a long shot, but... I was desperate. Because of that, I don't know what to do once the stone's influence was weakened. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I told High Rider. Alrighty then, he said, then jabbed his finger at me. You're fine by me, Larry. That's why I'm here. 
As soon as this is over with, I'm gone. And don't you say a word. You deal with the fallout on your own. Deal, I said. I stuck out my hand. I rider regarded it with suspicion, then took it. Let's ride, I said. First, we hit the armory. I rider got himself a shotgun, and I grabbed a revolver. I cracked open the cylinder and loaded it, and shoved a fistful of bullets into my pocket. Next, we went to the furniture factory, where I picked up a sledgehammer, a metal toolbox, and a heavy pair of gloves. We met no one as we worked, though we heard the sounds from other cell blocks. I found the chains and padlocks, and we went from cell block to cell block, looking at the doors. Through the wire mesh, windows set in the doors, we could see dead bodies, their blood-stained walls, and destruction. Jesus, H., I rather muttered. When we came back to the block, the building tenders had taken over. A man threw himself at the door, making both of us jump. His eyes were wide with madness, and foam spilled from his mouth, coating his chin and dribbling onto his naked chest like white rain. He pounded at the door and screamed in fury. He didn't have the presence of mind to try and open it, and High Rider and I quickly chained it shut. Come on, I said. We left the main building and crossed the darkened compound. Cat's house was in a quiet corner, separated from the main complex by a stand of trees. Two stories with a wraparound porch. It was dark against the night, and the moment I saw it, I could feel the stone's sickening energy. High Rider winced in pain and shot me a worried look. You could feel it? I asked. Yeah. High Rider said softly. I can feel it. Running at a crouch, we crossed the yard and crept up the steps. I didn't see that someone was sitting against the closed front door until I was on top of him. I froze. And in an errant shift of moonlight, I saw his face. Bare. His cheeks were hollow and sunken and his skin was pulled so tight against his skull that I could see every dip and recess. His arms were withered sticks, and his uniform pulled around him like a sheet. High Rider saw him and muttered a shocked curse. Bear's eyes opened, and he looked at us. His orbs were pure white, like milk, and he blinked as if trying to clear them. His breathing was labored, and phlegm rattled in his throat. I sat down the hammer and the toolbox and knelt beside him. You all right? I asked. It was a stupid question, but it was all I could think to say. Bear turned his head to look at me, and those unnerving eyes of his held me in their dark sway. His face suddenly changed, and his hand shot out grabbing my wrist in a crushing death grip. I winced in pain, and his lips peeled back from his teeth in a sinister smile. You can't stop us, he said. The voice that issued from his mouth was low and rattling, without tone or inflection, as though he, or the thing inside of him, was only mimicking human speech. We're too strong. We are many. He opened his mouth and lunged at me. My heart blasted into my throat and I tried to pull away. Moving far faster than his frame should have allowed, High Rider brought the butt of the rifle down on Bear's head, which splits with a wet thunk of a rotten melon. Bear's grip on me released and I yanked away falling on my butt. The long fissure appeared down the middle of Bear's face, and his eyes rolled back in his head. He went into violent convulsions, and a long moan squeezed from his chest. Green slime began to ooze from the crack in his face, then his entire head spread apart. Long ribbons of slime connected one side to the other, and in the terrible cavity... I glimpsed his brain. It was glowing. Without warning, 
It exploded, and warm goo splattered my face. I let out a cry of revulsion and scooted back. Panic seized in. High Rider dropped to one knee and tried to calm me. It's on me, I screamed. I had no idea how it, or whatever exactly it was, transmitted, but I knew I was covered in it. Throwing away the gun, High Rider quickly unbuttoned his shirt. Beneath, he wore a white v-neck tucked into his jeans. Shushing me, he wiped my face with his shirt the best he could, and I fought to regain control of myself. I'm fine, I said, and waved High Rider away. I'm fine. I looked at Bear. He was lying on the porch, dead, skull leaking that strange green smile. It was inside of him, I said numbly. It's probably inside of all of them, High Rider said. He grabbed the shotgun and got up. It's not the stones we gotta worry about. It's everybody here. This was far worse than I thought. Far, far worse. Feeling more unready than I ever had in my life. I got up. And together, we went inside. Inside, the living room was dark and silent. Shapes looming from the shadows like hidden monsters. My grip tightened on the sledgehammer, and beside me, High Rider held his shotgun tied to his chest. The only sound was the raging hiss of our own exhalations and holding my breath. I listened. Nothing. Where was Cat? Bear died loud, and if Cat was here, he'd surely come down to see what had happened. Maybe he was gone. Hell. Maybe he was dead. I squinted my eyes and peered into the shadows, trying to pick out the slightest movement. There were none. We were alone. Feeling bold, I flipped a switch by the door, and light filled the room, revealing a comfortably furnished space. An afghan was draped over the back of the sofa, Framed pictures hung on the walls, and the combination TV and turntable occupied a corner. We stay together, I whispered to High Rider. He nodded. First, we checked the living room, looking in every conceivable space in which someone could conceal themselves. Then we moved to the kitchen. We looked in cabinets, in closets, even in the crawl space under the house. We found nothing. Next, we climbed the stairs, High Rider's shotgun leading the way. Three closed doors greeted us. High Rider chose the one on the right. And that's where we found the bodies. A cat's wife and their two children, a boy and a girl, eight and ten, were tied up in the master bedroom. They lay on the bed side by side, faces buried in the mattress, Blood soaked the blankets and the carpet, splattered the headboard, the walls, the lamp, everything. An axe jutted from the little girl's back, and brass shell casings from a rifle littered the floor. My stomach turned, and High Rider went pale as a ghost. He turned around, looking dazed, and stumbled out into the hall. I followed a minute later, Feeling like I was going to be sick. What now? High Rider asked. He sounded defeated, as if finding those three innocents had taken whatever fight and life he had left in him. We call Huntsville, I said. Together, High Rider and I left that house of horrors and crossed the prison grounds. Neither one of us talking. The weight of the things we'd seen and the things we had learned was heavy between us. I don't know what he was thinking, but my thoughts were grim. There was no coming out of this alive, even if High Rider let me come with him. 
I was probably infected just like the others. And even if I wasn't, once this thing got out, it was a wrap. Not just for me, but for the entire world. All the human civilization to be gone. Dead. Infected by that alien scum shit. Inside the prison, we made our way to Kat's office. I opened the door and went in first. Before I knew what was happening, someone jammed a gun against the nape of my neck and shoved me forward. I rather let out a grunt, and when I looked back, guys in loincloths, their faces and chests painted with blood, were holding his arms. I told you you can't defeat us. A withered voice said. The swivel chair facing the window turned, and when I saw Cat, I gasped. Once muscular and tall, Cat was shriveled and bony now. Most of his hair and teeth had fallen out, and his skin was dotted with oozy boils and blisters. His eyes were milky white, just as bears had been and his toothless smile seemed impossibly wide. In his hands he held his precious stone like a newborn baby. The light from it was blinding. I could feel its bacon heat against my face, and I turned my head slightly to the side. In the weeks since we dug that damn thing out of the earth, that chunk, a cat's chunk, was the biggest I had seen. Both Cat and Bear spent so much of their day around it, and they had both withered away to nothing. Other guys got sick, others killed themselves, but none of them were as bad off as Cat and Bear. All at once, I understood. That piece was the most powerful. The other ones, the ones Cat had ordered scattered around the prison probably at the unwilling behest of the alien in his mind, were nothing. That was the seat of power. The other ones could do small-scale damage, but this bad boy right here, this was the world ender. The mothership. I had to get it away from him. We are going to suck the life force from your planet and then spit out your bones when we're done. Cat said. He stroked the stone and it began to pulsate. When we're done, we're gonna move on just like we always have. But you'll stay here and rot. He laughed. I like to think of myself as a thoughtful man, but no thought went into what I did next. I only reacted like an animal in a corner. I ran my elbow back into my captor's gut with all my might and ducked my head to the side to avoid taking his bullet. He let out a pained cry and stumbled back, falling against one of the men holding the High Rider. High Rider hooked his foot around the leg of the man holding him and tripped him. High Rider wrenched his arm away and his captors jumped on him. They all fell into the hall in a writhing heap. I spun around and clocked the guy who had the gun on me. I hit him so hard that his neck snapped and he dropped the gun landed on the floor. Get him. Get him. Cat cried. He sounded afraid. The next thing I knew, I threw myself at Cat. Instead of going for his eyes, I went for the stone. I grabbed it in both hands, and my palms sizzled against its red-hot surface. I screamed in agony, but refused to let go. Gritting his teeth, Cat tried to yank it away, but he was too weak. I pulled my way, and he pulled his. It was a high-stakes game of -of tug-of-war, and I could feel my skin melting and fusing to the rock. Finally, summoning a reserve of strength I didn't know I had, I wrestled the rock free from Cat's grip. He jumped to his feet, reaching for it, and wailing in a mixture of pain and fear. His face twisted, and his knees went out from under him. He fell, 
held on to the desk and tried to pull himself to his feet, but couldn't. The last thing I heard from Cat's mouth was a pathetic, Please, come back. I could never describe the amount of excruciating pain I was in holding that rock, so I won't even try. Imagine picking up a steel rod glowing orange with heat, and you might get an idea. I refused to let go. However, maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I was mad. I don't know. The thing was the most dangerous element, weapon, whatever that I'd been, and I finally had it. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with it, but I wasn't going to put it down and let it get away even if it killed me. I ran into the hall with it, where High Rider struggled with a pile of guards. My throat felt like it was going to rip wide open, and my head took on that dreamy, daisy sensation you get right before you pass out. The stone grew hotter and began flashing faster. In my hazed state, I somehow knew that it was going to explode. Once it did, Its spores would spread far and wide, weaker, maybe, but in time. Oh, in time. Laying hold of his revolver, High Rider elbowed one of the men off of him and shot another in the head. His face was bloody and blood oozed from bite wounds on his neck and hands. One ear was completely gone, and his face was pale from blood loss. One of the men slammed into him and the gun went flying. At last, I could take no more. I flung the rock to the floor, fell against the wall, and looked at my hands. They were raw and bloody. Long strands of skin melted from them like gooey cheese from a fresh-baked pizza. The stone flashed faster, emitting an ear-rattling thump like the blades of a helicopter. My survival instincts kicked in, and I struggled down the hall, using the wall to keep myself upright. We gotta go, I screamed. High Rider shoved his final adversary back, brought the gun weakly up, and fired. The round took the dude in the head, and he slumped back. High Rider tried to get to his feet, but he was too weak. The stone was flashing faster, louder. Someone called out, and suddenly, the hall was flooded with people, the last remnants of Anderson unit, inmates and building tenders alike. They were in varying stages of plague, death, and madness, and they ran at me. High Rider managed to squeeze a single shot off before they were on him. Screaming, I looped down the hall. I reached the door and slammed through it just as the stone exploded. Fire licked my back and the force of the blast threw me up and forward. I hit the ground and rolled. The world seemed to lurch and a violent shudder raced through the building. I got to my hands and knees, but a muffled voice stopped me. I looked up and my stomach dropped. Three men in yellow hazmat suits, two of them carrying flamethrowers, stood over me, respirators on their faces. I had forgotten that Cat sent some of the stone to a university to be studied. I had no idea that Washington was on high alert and that the government had been converging on Anderson for hours. As I passed out, my only thought was, I wish y'all got here earlier. Then, I slept. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The walls were serene, the overhead light was blinding, and everything was made out of chrome. For a terrible second, I was sure that I'd been abducted by the same aliens who had sent their spores to Earth, but then a human voice cracked through a loudspeaker, staving my fear. I was in a top-secret government facility, it told me, and I was being kept for observation. I was there 
for over ten years. Every day, all night long, they poked, prodded, and studied me. Early on, they told me that I was immune to the spores, that I had felt some of their effects, but that there was something about my DNA that protected me. They told me later that roughly 25% of the human population shared my immunity. They were afraid I would develop complications or that there was something inside of me, laying dormant and waiting to wake one day in the future, but they never found anything. The lab, I later learned, was deep beneath a mountain somewhere in the Rockies. I'm not too sure, but I think the government used it to research weaponized smallpox, plague, and superflu. I had no hard evidence of this, but from things I overheard, the spore samples they took from Anderson was one of the least deadly things down there with us. For a long time, they wouldn't tell me what happened at Anderson. Just that it was taken care of. Over the years, I pieced the story together. First, they sprayed fire and fury on every single building in the compound. There was no doubt there were men still alive in there, but they torched it anyway. And maybe that was for the best. Next, they took control of the property and cordoned it off. To this day, it belongs to the government and is heavily guarded. Every so often, they take tests of the soil and the water. There are legends saying you get sick or lose your mind if you go too close, but that you'll get better, just so long as you stay clear of it. The locals say it's haunted, and tell each other ghost stories about the spirits of vengeful prisoners. If only that were the case. They finally let me out of the hospital in 1991, and sent me back to TDC. They swore me to secrecy, and added a thousand dollars a month to my books to keep me quiet. They promised they'd help me get parole, and I finally did, after 42 straight years. I went back to Anderson in 2018, getting as close as the old dirt service road before seeing the first camera and no trespassing sign. As soon as I got out of the car, I could feel the tension in the air. Those spores are still out there. Not enough of them to do what they did to Bear and Cat, but sometimes I wonder about the men who guard the place. They're always around it, day after day, shift after shift. Do they have nightmares? Do they hack and sweat? Do they bleed green when they nick themselves shaven? I have no answers to these questions, and honestly, I don't know if I want any. If life had taught me one thing, it's this. Sometimes, you're better off not knowing the truth. <laughs>